here in Manchester. Well, here for me, obviously not here for all of you, but we're based here in Manchester. It's a project about improving biodiversity in the city, but also trying to connect people better with their local nature in the city. So, so that's what Ellie and myself do. Um, we're really pleased to welcome Rachel Webster from Manchester Museum here tonight as well. But before I hand over to her, uh, I'll just go through a few of the usual housekeeping points. Um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with Zoom now, aren't they? So your cameras are off, we can't see you. Your microphones are off, we can't hear you. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, it'd be great if you did throughout the talk. Please use the chat. And if you've got specific questions, can you pop them in the Q&A? Because we're more likely to notice them in there. And we'll have five or ten minutes at the end when um, Rachel and Ellie and I will be able to answer any questions that you put in there. So that'd be great. Um, the session's also being recorded, just to let you know that. So if you have to pop off halfway through, you'll be able to access the link on our YouTube channel later. Um, I think that's it for housekeeping. So yeah, we're really pleased to welcome Rachel Webster here tonight. She's the curator of botany at Manchester Museum, which is part of the University of Manchester, isn't it, Rachel? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I'd just like to hand you over. Thanks very much. Hello there. So um, yes, I'm the, the curator of botany. Um, and I, I've been at the museum now for, I think it's eight years. So I've, I've spent um, quite a bit of time there um, in doing sort of various projects for the museum. And you have to say, this is one of the strangest years yet. Um, so I've put together this presentation after talking to Ellie and Hilary. Uh, so I'll share my screen. Um, I, if this isn't too much of a burden on Ellie, normally I am happy to take questions partway through because otherwise I tend to rattle on, but we'll see what, what turns up while people um, are listening to me. So <laughs> I will attempt to share my screen as the first part of the, the challenge. Here we go. So I was, uh, we, we decided on the title of Wildflowers, Weeds and VIPs. So I think you can talk to lots of um, people who are interested in, in plants and come up with some ideas about the words wildflowers and weeds and which way you, you want to fall down on the fence of how much you like to use those words. Um, so I work for Manchester Museum. This, if you haven't visited, is uh, an artist's impression of it in the Victorian era. So um, this is part of the historic buildings of the University of Manchester. And the museum was one of the last bits of the old quad to be, to be built, finishing off the corner uh, to house a natural history museum. And uh, so the, the natural history galleries are the oldest part of the museum. And I rattle around as the mad woman in the attic in this particular bit of the building. So if you were to visit Oxford Road today, there firstly wouldn't be horses and carriages, but there would also be a few more buildings coming up to the right. So the building uh, grew and extended as more collections were donated to the museum around things like uh, Egyptology and ethnography and so on. So it looks a bit different uh, these days. So obviously, as with everyone else at the moment, we are working from home and are closed to visitors. So we have some online resources um, if you want to take a look at the kind of exhibitions we put on and the sort of work we're doing as a museum. And certainly a lot of my colleagues have been doing some really brilliant regular talks and podcasts on various topics. And funnily enough, frogs and Egyptology are quite popular. Um, so there's plenty of that to read about and explore if you wanted to. So my role is to look after the botanical collections. So we have quite a, a varied assortment of material. Um, we've got uh, flowering plants, non-flowering plants like mosses and ferns. We've got seaweeds. Um, we've got uh, fungi because the Victorians didn't know where else to put them, so put them in with the botany collection. And the material comes in all different kinds of shapes and sizes. So we've got 
pressed plants, we've got plants pickled and preserved in spirit jars, um, we've got illustrations and drawings and uh, slides for projection, as well as kind of 3D objects like chunks of timber, um, bits of um, fibre and so on. And some really lovely um, microscopic bits of botany as well on, on slides that we've been doing a project to look at in more detail recently. So my role is to get all of this stuff used. And the majority of it, I have to say, is flat. So we have a lot of pressed plants on herbarium sheets, which aren't the best things in the world for putting out on display. Um, so the plants are pressed and then either stitched, glued, or in our case, quite a lot of them are attached with a piece of gummed paper. And then it's really important that they've got a label with the, the important information of kind of what, who, where, um, and when. So I'm now going to attempt, <laughs> oh yes, so all these flat things are stored in our boxes um, in uh, kind of folders according to a kind of taxonomic sequence to help us find them when people need to see the, the material. Um, so let's hope this works. I'll need a thumbs up from you Ellie and Hilary to see if I start to play. Oh, that's all right. So hopefully you're only hearing me once and not a weird kind of echo. Um, so this is our main room of the herbarium and this is where we welcome visitors and do most of our work. So we have our wonderful um, herbarium volunteers and they come in and help us um, with information, uh, sorting out collections. Is something going wrong, Ollie? I'm going to stop. You've got a little bit of an echo. I've got a little bit of an echo, haven't I? Yes, let me do that. Let's see. Is that better? Quieter. Mm. I think so. It's feeding back through me, I think, because I have to have my speaker on to hear you. And so it's playing things. Anyway, this is our main room. We have our visitors come in and see us. We have um, people who are helping us uh, conserve the collection and care for it and we're also having visitors come in to do um, research whether that's kind of personal investigations to improve their plant ID skills or whether they're doing some kind of historic or scientific research as part of a larger project. Um, we get people who are coming in say to look at the spread of a plant disease through time that happens to have been preserved on the sheets uh, in the collections or the social history of the collectors who've, who've been uh, amassing this material. We also get a huge number of visitors from the um, uh, School of Arts down, um, down the road from us to come in and look for inspiration. And away from our main room, we have this sort of series of smaller corridors and rooms where we have our huge amount of material stored in our green boxes. Um, so the collection itself runs to about 900,000 items and of that about three quarters of a million of them are pressed plants on herbarium sheets stored in these boxes. And so as if we were taking this <laughs> route for real, I would be telling you something about the, the various people and the history of the, the collection and uh, how it's been constructed. Um, so we've got quite a lot of interesting kind of historical information. So if I open up one of these um, folders inside, everything's arranged taxonomically so that you get one species of plant inside a folder. Um, and this was some, uh, this was a film I took in a rush at the beginning of the first lockdown for some students who were doing something about indigo. So that's why this is all indigo themed. And these are wild collected plants from all over the world. So we have um, we not only have plants from the UK and Ireland, but we also have plants uh, from other places um, around the world. And this is our um, cultivated plants collection. So while some of the material is wild collected, others are from gardens and have been um, collected from, say, botanic gardens from around the world. Uh, and this particular a collector created these sort of scrapbook affairs. So this one is from Chatsworth in 1865. He has got some of the worst handwriting possible. Um, and he put it together with all these illustrations that he took out of books. Um, so they're, they're 
plates from uh, herbals and little um, identification keys and clippings from newspapers. So you can see that there's little bits of information attached with some of these uh, as I flick through them. And then we also have, as well as the material that came from specific collectors and sort of their passions and their way of collecting things which were either from the university. So this is a, a university uh, materia medica, a pharmacy collection, or things that the museum has decided it wants to buy or trade or try and get from somebody like Q uh, in order to put on display. So we have a lot of fibres and textiles. Um, and this being Manchester, this was obviously quite a big interest and we have nine different drawers of cotton. Um, so I imagine um, that these sort of cotton specimens might have been once in someone's office for kind of quality control purposes and they were looking at it uh, to see what, what grew where and, and what kind of uh, strength the, the fabric ha would have. Um, Similarly then, we have material that was sort of produced for schools and for uh, education purposes, things that would be sent out um, so that you could inform uh, people about the ways that plants were being used across the British Empire and, and traded um, and the goods that resulted from that. So this is, this is me now closing the doors and leaving the herbarium. Um, so I'm going to stop uh, at this point and I should be able to then scoot on to talk a bit more about plants. So the thing with the herbarium collection is that people really like looking for stuff when they're on holiday. So on the left, I've got a daisy, and this was used in an exhibition about Alan Turing and the maths of, of how flower heads are arranged. And it took me ever such a long time to find a nice daisy in the collection because they were all full of strange forms that have been infected by viruses and oddly shaped. And I did a search on our catalogue today for nettles and we have three records in our catalogue for nettles. This is one of them on the right. I'm sure there are probably more in the collection, they just haven't been digitised yet. But uh, if I were to go and to look for a rare plant or something that came from some interesting location, uh, you know, a nice nature reserve somewhere, we'd probably have more examples. So there's this kind of problem with recorder bias in our herbarium of where the material comes from and that people are looking for really interesting things. And if there's one thing that this lockdown has done, it's meant that we have really been paying far, far more attention than usual to our local patch and those paths that, uh, that normally you're hurrying down to catch the bus or the train or to get to the supermarket or whatever. And personally, I really like to see this sort of frothy edge of greenery that's coming in on, on all of these, uh, these paths and byways. I like the way that it sort of softens the edges and brings a little bit of nature back into the city. So at this point, I'm going to stop and ask Ellie to put up a poll for us to see whether where you're feeling about this sort of letting a little bit of messiness into our urban environment. So you should see that appear now. Um, so if you if you saw all that greenery that Rachel was talking about, would you leave it or would you weed it? Let us know. Seems that leave it is winning. You're at the right talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think pretty much everyone is is gonna go for the go for the leave it. I think we're all we're all on your team, Rachel. I did yeah. have my suspicions, really. Um, yeah, I went to a conference once where they said, if you're getting a standing ovation, you're in the wrong room because you need to be talking to the people who don't listen. <laughs> um, but it is always nice to meet like minded people. Um, so if you are interested, uh, you can. Oh, look at that. 100 percent. Um, if you are prepared to live with a little bit of messiness, you can look out this year, uh, the Plant Life's No Mo May will be coming up again and their Every Flower Counts survey. So they'll be looking to see uh, if you stop mowing your garden, how many flowers will you get uh, growing and how many different kinds of pollinators that might be able to support based on the nectar that all those flowers produce. Um, so if you want to have a go at uh, allowing a little bit more wild into your garden, if you have one, sadly I don't have a lawn so I can't join in on this, my backyard isn't going to cut the mustard. Um, 
that is quite a nice thing that will be happening uh, when we get a bit further into spring. I always lose the little buttons down there. Um, so I also think that uh, quite apart from wildlife that nature in cities and that little bit of roughness around the edges is quite important. So um, for me, thinking about my first memory of interacting with a wild plant as opposed to something in my parents' garden or something in a park is this one, pineapple weed. And I remember sitting on a curb and it's really hot so the tarmac is warm and sticky and I'm fertling around in the dirt at the edges messing about with this plant. And I really enjoyed the fact, not only that it smelt of pineapple and looked like one, which was just crazy, but if you get it just right, you can ping the flowers off and get them to fly quite nicely. And then it's just really interesting when you start to look at it and pull it apart, it's made of so many little things. So this is, you know, counts as my kind of first, of what I can remember, this is my first interaction with nature and it's a result of something that was living its best life in a crack <laughs> in a pavement uh, in Swansea. So later on I find out that this actually is quite an interesting plant, it's not really from the UK, it comes from elsewhere across Asia and perhaps in, in North America and it made a break for freedom from gardens where it was cultivated and so the first example of it was as an escape from Kew Gardens in 1871. So it's funny how the things that are around us that we think are so sort of commonplace can actually have some really rather interesting stories to them. So I went out with my little friend, my Lego beekeeper, to have a look on the pavements of where I live to see, uh, see what I could find. And well, we've had snow and we've had hail, and it's still relatively early in March. So there's not going to be many flowers to this talk. Um, so my Lego man is oh, about two centimetres tall for scale. Um, and so we went looking at the places where soil accumulates, where it's been washing out of uh, flower beds or off grassy areas. And we were looking at the places where soil is beginning to develop and build up, where we've got moss sort of collecting enough uh, kind of uh, organic matter and moisture for plants to start to grow. And then those which are just really bullish and will find any kind of crevice and that'll do, they're going to do. Uh, what they want to uh, and grow. So this, um, as I say, not many flowers, lots of leaves, and this is a good moment to mention um, that this sort of rosette shape of a circle of leaves uh, like this, um, last week it happened to be um, rosette wildflower hour. So if you're interested in getting help finding what you have uh, spotted out on your walks, you can um, join in and find in and, and this kind of wild hour, wildflower hour challenge on a Sunday night and share what you've found. And often there's a kind of uh, challenge every week as to what it is that you're looking for. So up and coming this Sunday will be violets. If you happen to live somewhere warmer than I do and you've got something in flower by now. And you can share on Twitter, Instagram, there's a web page uh, or there's a Facebook group that you can join in and get some advice from botanists who are online uh, to talk about what it is that you've seen. So the first thing that I went out and found then was some really common weeds, although I hate that word, uh, urban wildflowers of uh, the UK. So this one here is chickweed. I found a nice sprawling little example of chickweed. And if I'd been in my collection, I'd have been able to get out one of our old herbals and talk to you about um, the uses of it in the past. Um, sadly, I couldn't, but it does give me the opportunity to tell you about this, which is the Biodiversity Heritage Library website, which if you're interested in old natural history books and uh, the kind of plates and illustrations of natural history, it's a really wonderful website and you can lose hours in it. And these are some examples of John Gerard's herbal from a library in the States. And it's one of the, uh, it's a kind of good example for talking about the challenges of using common names because he details 11 different chickweeds, um, of which we wouldn't call them chickweeds today probably, um, but because they're referring to the purposes of what you use the plant for rather than their kind of relationship 
um, <clears throat> and how uh, similar they are. So down here under the virtues on the left, it's a bit fuzzy, but it gives you some of the things that you can use your chickweed for when you've collected it. Um, so if you've made a poultice, you can take away swelling of the legs and other separations, which I think you'd want to get rid of those separations. And I particularly like the leaves boiled in vinegar and salt is good against manginess of the hands and legs if they're bathed therewith. But it also gives a bit of an indication about why it gets its name of little birds in cages, especially linnets, are refreshed with the lesser chickweed. So um, even up until Victorian times, there would have been people going out in urban areas collecting plants like chickweed and like groundsel, which I think comes next, uh, in order to feed it to the canaries or the, the birds in cages and to give them a little bit of uh, extra food. So this sort of neatness and uh, tidiness in, in urban areas, some of that kind of weeding that was done in the past was for purposes to collect these plants rather than to remove them from the place that they were growing. Um, so even this one, I have to say, you know, it's not the most attractive plant, um, but it can be really important in the environment. Um, <clears throat> so these are, uh, oh gosh, my mind's gone blank now, lovely red, moth. Cinnabar. Thank, Thank you. you, yeah. <laughs> Cinnabar moths um, are really important for the, the life cycle with the uh, caterpillars growing on them. So this plant was directly outside the vet growing on a pavement and had about 12 caterpillars growing, uh, eating happily on it. And it took me very much longer to find an example growing out of a pavement of another common uh, plant of urban areas, Herb Bennett which I suspect means that it doesn't really like these conditions as much as some of the others, and it would prefer to be in a hedgerow or in a bit of woody uh, land. <clears throat> um, and I found from our collection, we do have a nice illustration from that collection I was showing you earlier. So this is an 18th century book plate. Um, and one of the things that it has uh, quite clearly shown on here is how variable the leaves are, which in the accompanying text, it's helpfully also in Latin because that was the scientific language of the time. Although to be fair to the people who are printing it, I can see it's more efficient taking up more space uh, to say it in English. Uh, but it's talking about how variable the leaves are, which can be a challenge. So if you're out and about looking for plants, it's useful to make sure that you've looked at all the different examples of the different kinds of leaves that grow on it. So whether it's growing from the base or up the stalk, and that can help you identify things. It's also got uh, really nice details on the little flowers showing the, uh, the, le uh, the petals and the sepals. And of course the, the hooked seeds that mean that it's a really effective um, at dispersing, catching on, on animals and people and getting transported around. And again, was useful. Uh, in times gone by. So apparently the sort of clove scent that it had would be useful for getting rid of your bad breath if you were to put it in there or to make your beer smell better so that people would carry on drinking it. I don't know that anyone carries on doing that sort of thing today. Um, so for some plants they're just making do in the environment that they found themselves in but others are really sort of uh, thriving and this is one of the examples is Danish scurvy grass. Um, so this is a very uh, diminutive little plant that will be um, much bigger later on in the year um, but I'm going to stop my share here and try and share something different um, which is the NBN atlas to show uh, the distribution of this plant and how this has changed uh, in recent years. So uh, the scurvy grass is because it's full of vitamin C and allegedly it's the sort of plant that sailors would eat to keep away scurvy. And um, it is very tolerant of high levels of salt. So it used to be reliably found growing on the coast. Um, but if you look at this map here, showing the distribution of it across the northwest, you, we've got some points that are kind of occurrences in grid squares. We've got larger grid squares here and more uh, concentrated surveying up in uh, Lancashire. But what you can also see is these point occurrences that are happening 
all the way along in these lines here. And I think that's probably the M57 and this one is the M62. And so this plant has found that it really loves the central reservation of motorways. And with the salt spreading that's done for winter, um, it can find a whole load of new environments for it to grow on. And what's also interesting is that there's no record on the map from this sort of Thameside high peak border that I have photographed mine in. So really, I should make sure that someone can put a dot here to show that it has reached where I live. So to do that, I could go on to this website here, I record, and I could put in a biological record to say that I found this species living in my environment, and that can help people plot where things are moving to across the country. So I'll stop that one and move back to my PowerPoint presentation which I have to find the right slide now, don't I? <laughs> so many pictures. Um, here we go. So, um, the only thing that's really been flowering around me because it's uh, a bit colder, hopefully down in Manchester, you've got more things flowering, uh, but I've been having Whitlow grasses, which are incredibly cute en masse as a lovely little forest of tiny flowers. Um, I, I had to set, sit my Lego man down, they're so small. Um, and people have gone to the trouble of picking them and collecting them to identify them and press them onto herbarium sheets. This one is a monster of a plant with many, many uh, uh, flowering stalks. But it's actually, not only is it small, but these are quite, can be quite difficult to identify. So if you've got something that's a bit of a challenge, then this is uh, where I'd recommend to go and look for more information with the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. And they have this page of plant cribs. So if you've got something which is a little bit of a challenge to work out exactly what species it is you're looking at, you can go here and get some expert advice on the key things to look for to try and get uh, a better identification for what your species is that you're looking at. So for mine, having looked at the Aerophila crib, the Whitlow grasses, one of the, the um, better features for trying to classify them on is on this petal shape and how much, how far the split goes down the middle of the petal. So <clears throat> And one of the two likely species that this could have been, I'd been looking for a split that goes halfway or more down that petal, or kind of halfway and less. And I think personally that that's under halfway. I don't know what you think. It's definitely not two thirds, half to two thirds, is it? And so I think I've found the glabrous Whitlow grass, uh, Aerophila glabrescens growing in the cobbles of my marketplace. <laughs> and I looked very silly uh, trying to photograph this down a hand lens on the middle of the street. But um, it's one thing you have to learn to accept as a botanist is that people are going to come up and ask you if you're all right and whether you need any help because you're probably sat on the ground somewhere <laughs> bent over looking at something tiny at the edge of a car park. Um, so in comparison, a relatively larger uh, relative, another member of the cabbage family, is Arabidopsis thaliana, um, thalecrest, though very few people ever talk about it in terms of its um, common name, and every plant scientist around the world will know it by the name Arabidopsis, and it's a kind of superstar of plant science. So this plant um, is the model organism for all plant science. So it's the one that people are most likely to study to try and understand how a plant works. And it was first suggested as the model organism for plant science in 1943 by a, a German scientist. And that's for a number of reasons, because it's got a really short life cycle. You can get it from seed to seed in eight to 12 weeks. Um, it's very easy to grow. <clears throat> The, your, there's lots of different variation within the species, so lots of different kinds of leaf morphology, for instance, uh, and you can cross the plants and, and watch how that separates. And each plant can produce many thousands of seeds. <clears throat> so it had the, I don't know if you can call it an honour, but it was certainly um, a marked innovation that it was the first plant to have its genome fully sequenced in 2000. 
so it uh, is native across quite a large area across uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, um, uh, India, and into North America, uh, North Africa, sorry. And then it's been introduced by human activity around uh, an awful lot of the rest of the globe. So one of the things that people have done is to collect seeds from specific geographic regions, they call them ecotypes, and they look at the adaptations and how those different ecotypes are different depending on where they came from in the world. So this is an example of one of the projects that they've been doing with it, um, where they are looking to uh, sort of um, sequence the genomes of 1001, as it says, examples of Arabidopsis, so that you can have a better understanding of how it's varying across the planet. Uh, and you can see with these pictures here, the kind of uh, different sort of density of leaves, longer stalks, different leaf shapes and so on. So if you read any information about understanding how plants take up nutrients, how plants capture light, how plants make seeds, um, all of this, it has probably at some point been um, an experiment that someone has done with Arabidopsis thaliana in, uh, in a, a laboratory in a greenhouse somewhere around the world. Then we get two of my favorites. So um, Herb Robert, a uh, little geranium and Shining Crane's Bill. I really like this one because it has such cute leaves, um, which are nice and, and shiny and glossy. So they're a little bit waxier to help um, prevent water loss, though this wasn't really a problem at the particular time that I was going around um, hunting for plants uh, in the steady drizzle. And you can tell they're some of my favourites because if I look on the iNaturalist app that we sometimes use, they're in my top five observations. <laughs> it's for both Herb Robert and Shining Crane's Bill. So um, this is uh, somewhat like iRecord and also the uh, uh, iSpot. Other alternatives are available. Um, but we use uh, this wildlife spotting app to help us deliver the City Nature Challenge, which will be coming up shortly. So you can take a photograph of something that you've seen out on a walk, load it up onto what amounts to a kind of social media for naturalists, either on your phone or on a computer. And there's a kind of um, artificial intelligence part of it that will help suggest what you might have seen, though Ellie has had some spectacular fails on that. <laughs> And then there's um, a community of users who will help you refine your identify, identification and confirm what you've seen. So it's quite a nice one, like iSpot, to start with um, if you want to get into to seeing what's out there and identifying, particularly in groups that you don't know, for instance. I put up lots of insects, like my seven spot ladybird. Um, so the City Nature Challenge is a wildlife spotting event. Um, it happens worldwide, although it started off in California as a kind of competition between the California Academy of Sciences and the Natural History Museum, Los Angeles County. And there's now, well, last year, I think there was 150 cities worldwide took part. Um, I haven't looked at the totals this year, but there are 12 areas taking part in the UK, of which Liverpool City Region, Lancashire and Greater Manchester are three of them. And you can find out how we did in the challenge by going to the Lanx Wildlife Trust website to see how spectacular we all were. Um, but it's quite fun for encouraging people to get out and to take notice of the things that are really growing on your doorstep rather than heading off into the hills and uh, visiting the rare and interesting and wonderful out there. So I think um, I, it's, it's also kind of useful for the sort of plants that you, you might find growing in urban areas that really shouldn't be there. So uh, this is a nice, um, I've called it granny's bonnets rather than columbine because I think growing in a city street, uh, this is going to be a garden escape of an aquilegia that's probably a kind of horticultural variety from someone's garden. So when you're looking around in your urban environment, you'll find a lot of things that have come from gardens and have naturalized. You can also find lots of things that have come from overseas and have fallen off people's shoes or off tires and you can get uh, kind of unexpected species growing in, in um, cracks in pavements or in brownfield sites and car parks and so on. 
And so if you've taken out a guidebook to the plants of uh, the British Isles, you might not find what you're looking for um, because it might not, uh, under normal circumstances, um, be native in the UK. So it can be quite useful to have these kind of apps to help you decide what it is that you're looking at. Which brings me on to these ones. So um, under the classic rosette, lots of the things that I found whilst walking around um, my hometown looking at pavement plants was dandelions and everyone can pretty much recognise a dandelion. So time for our next poll, Ellie. Cool, here we go. I'm excited. How do you feel about dandelions? Do you love them or do you hate them? Let us know. Don't worry, oh, it is all anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> are they a Marmite plant? Yeah, they are, they are a bit of a Marmite plant, aren't they, I suppose? <laughs> so yeah, let us know. It seems like love them is winning. Few people hate them, but maybe you can change their minds, Rachel. Maybe. Depends on the reasons for hating them. It does, does depend on the reasons for hating them. <laughs> Yeah, Judith says, depends where they are. Fair yeah. enough, Judith. <clears throat> okay. That is one of the problems. Still pretty positive now. Keep forward to them. So in my house, I let them grow because it's quite a handy thing <laughs> to have available for uh, feeding my other house guests. Um, but I, I dread to think what the neighbours think when I, as I say, I don't have a lawn, I have a lot of containers. And so I just, <laughs> like a shrub with a whole load of dandelions growing underneath them. <laughs> they must just think I'm really lazy about my, my weeding. But anyway, these are my two rabbits and they do love a dandelion. Um, and it's very helpful. Um, to be able to give them something that I know what's happened to the plant beforehand if I'm giving them some uh, wild collected food. Oh, this is the problem, is now I've got that, yay. So I was looking around and it's a bit too early with me to have any flowers. So uh, my little beekeeper was a bit disappointed he couldn't get his bees out, um, that there's some buds hiding in the centre of that rosette and this was the closest I got to and one in the park is almost there so I don't know whether anything's looking more likely in any of the places that you're in. Yeah yeah I've got a, got a few seen a few out yeah, yeah. yeah on some sunny days yeah not many but the first few are braving it. Looking a little bit better um, <clears throat> and so here's here's one I saw previously um, with a nice honeybee visiting it. And we tend to think about these kind of plants as being good for pollinators, which they are, you know, they've got a big um, easy platform to land on. So they're good for kind of generalist pollinators to visit and to, to collect um, nectar from. Um, some of them pollen, but not all of them. But what we also don't think about perhaps um, is uh, other insects and uh, the different parts of the uh, the plant that can that it can help support so of course you're going to have things like leaf miners little flies laying their eggs and the larvae developing inside the leaf to hatch out later or you might get uh, things like ground beetles that are finding the seeds and uh, eating them um, to keep them going so as well as providing uh, food for <clears throat> for visiting pollinators on the flowers there's also a host of other kinds of uh, insects and you know furry rabbits who are going to enjoy <laughs> visiting and, and eating these plants as part of their diet. Um, and they get a bit of a bad press because we're really happy with any other kind of daisy really. <laughs> so this is a, um, a one of our 19th century uh, botanical teaching posters and this is your generic daisy um, made from thousands of tiny little individual flowers of which you've got the ones on the outside with the big uh, petal-like ligule so the ray florets and the ones without anything petal-like the little disc florets that make up the bit in the middle and you know there's a like there's a park in Buxton where 
it's a, just a wash with millions of daisies and people go and they take photographs and they think it's absolutely beautiful and wonderful. But you never get quite the same response from people if you've just got, say, a roundabout that's absolutely full of golden shining daffodil, uh, daffodils, dandelions. I think that's a bit of a shame, really. Um, so instead of having that central disc, all the tiny little individual flowers in a dandelion head have that uh, ligule, that tooth, um, tongue like petal projection out the back. And so that gives it a sort of shaggy appearance. And we're, it's so kind of ingrained that these are weeds that any member of the daisy family, which also has a dandelion like flower, gets automatically lumped in with the kind of, well, it's a weed, <laughs> it needs to come out, which is a bit of a pity, really. So we had. Um, me and some colleagues got called to um, write some interpretation boards for a newly installed green roof on one of the university buildings because people were disappointed with the amount of dandelions that they had growing in it. When, of course, they were actually just a sort of selection of drought tolerant other members of the Asteraceae who happened to have lovely little yellow flowers. So you can go online and have a hunt for the Dandelion Appreciation Society. There's a web page or there's some uh, social media accounts and show some love for, for dandelions out there in the world. Um, so one of the reasons you might hate them if you have been spending a lot of time as a botanist is that they are botanically very interesting and therefore also a real challenge and very difficult to identify. So pretty much you can recognize a dandelion, but then recognizing which dandelion you're looking at takes a really serious amount of study. And so there's only uh, a kind of select bunch of um, botanists who are happy to put in the many hours to be able to tell them apart. So um, they are also kind of plastic. So they can look really different in different places is what that means. So if you've got a really happy dandelion and a really stressed out dandelion of the same little species, they could be really different growing in each place. And so this is one of the things that's really useful for coming and visiting a herbarium. Come in and see, these are all ours from Manchester. And they make a surprisingly beautiful herbarium sheet. Now I imagine it was a nightmare to get all of those little teeth on the leaves looking perfect on each of them. Um, but dandelions are interesting because most species don't require pollen to set seed. So they are effectively cloning themselves and setting seed for the next generation just from the female part of the flower. And so effectively, you've got in the UK um, something like 230 different micro species that are all just not sharing the genes and all uh, different. So this is the key thing that you need these kind of voucher specimens in herbaria to come and look and convince yourself that you know what it is that you're looking at when you go out and study them in the field. And should you get interested and want to know, there is a classic handbook which um, on lockdown, I did grab as I came out of the museum and I'm hoping this year I might get to go out and see, see if I can get better at identifying dandelions. And there's also, uh, last year, there were some great um, introductory videos put up by the botanist Joshua Stiles. If you visit his YouTube channel, you can see some of the introductions to the different uh, tribes of dandelions that you can find growing in the UK. So they're a lot more interesting than people give them credit for. Um, so here is one of my favourite um, uh, dandelion-like plants, and it was blowing a gale, so these ones aren't in focus, but I wanted to put it up there largely because I like this photo that I took in West Gorton, where someone had just laid a pavement, and this little colt's foot was having nothing of it, um, pushed up the flowers through the, through the tarmac um, to, <laughs> um, to carry on its life cycle. So uh, at this time of the year around me, I've got the flowers up, um, probably they're beginning to go over a bit somewhere down in Manchester when it's a bit warmer, but you can look out for those. So I'm hoping that all these things that I've seen on my walks recently are going to be allowed to stay and flower <laughs> and that I'll be able to see them in the summer um, when I'm still taking my urban walks um, around Glossop and having a look what's out there, feeding the insect populations around and about. And I think increasingly I'm not the only person who is on this kind of mad trajectory and that there's a lot of people if on social media who are sharing a kind of plea to uh, let things get a bit wilder. And um, there are some countries like France and Germany, there are some cities that are kind of uh, more 
progressive on this sort of uh, no weeding and no spraying. And uh, in particular, I think if you want to find out more, this is a really good place to go. The botanist Sophie Lagai, who has got a website all about urban wildflowers. And if you look at the how green is your town, we get two points for the northwest. So we've got Trafford and Berry, both for some reductions in spraying of glyphosate. Which brings me to the end, and I hope that at some point in the future I might be able to invite you back in to come and see some of the things for real. But it is lovely to speak to such a sort of far-flung audience through this uh, through this method. And so uh, I will end it there. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was absolutely fascinating. Oh, yeah. Just a bit of an echo again. Am I echoing? No, no, no. OK, well, no, thank you very much. Um, that was really great, really interesting. Um, and yeah, I have been to uh, the collection and, and visited your office. And uh, yes, what a brilliant place it is. One question I've got for you, Rachel, is are you still collecting? I mean, there are some collections <clears throat> now. Is it, is it still present? Is it all still in the mm. past or how does it work now? So in the past, it was much more of a kind of general hobby and there were far more people doing it. Now people are largely doing it um, for botanical, kind of specifically botanical reasons. So things like um, uh, having voucher specimens of difficult to identify taxa like dandelions and brambles <laughs> and so on. Um, and so very often those people who specialise in identifying them will have their own collection and they want to leave it in a museum somewhere uh, available so that others can kind of verify their finds or come and search them in future. So we don't collect on the same sort of scale as we did in the past. Um, and uh, so, so, yeah, some of it is like donations of, of material from individuals but then the museum might decide that we want something to like um, specifically for an exhibition or for a purpose we might also go out and collect something ourselves to demonstrate something that we feel our historic material isn't really showing like you know, plants that are newly arrived to the UK for instance um, aren't going to be in amongst my 1850s odd um, species um, collection dates so Right, okay. Yes, not and as much. Yeah, and you're already up to, did you say 900,000? That was roughly. my latest estimate. Yeah, gosh, <laughs> gosh, amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Someone has asked, um, what is your favourite weed or wildflower, Rachel? Oh, that's ever so tricky. I'm usually really bad at this because I just pick something seasonal because it's what I saw when I was... <laughs> <laughs> looking at it um but one thing I was really enjoying last year was the fox gloves um because we've got a lot of dry stone walls around us and they just crazily come popping out basically I like plants in walls I think that's the answer um but if you stood next to them I like the way that the bees go in and do that buzz pollination and make the whole thing vibrate <laughs> as they're releasing the pollen from out of the uh, anthers in the flower so yeah yeah, that's nice. Um, somebody's asking, are you planning any specific botanical events at the museum when lockdown ends? Do you know, have you got plans for that? Or? So we tend really to do things which are more all encompassing nature. So we are going to have some nature themed uh, new changing exhibition open hopefully in mid-May <laughs> um, that um, will feature a soundscape called Wild Chorus um, which was uh, um, Sonic Rewild who were um, capturing sounds during lockdown because we were all out noticing more about nature and so we're going to have something of a bit of display around that which will feature various different bits from the natural history collections. Um, but we are going through a period of redevelopment and we will, before too long, be opening our new extension. And so we'll have lots more um, material out on show from across the collection. So that features a South Asia gallery and a Chinese culture 
uh, gallery. So I'm hoping that some botanical stories will get into those as well, because obviously there's lots of important stories around kind of economic and trade and also sort of garden history and that kind of thing. Yeah, oh, well, talking of gardens, uh, someone's, uh, Joanne's asking if you're planning any collaboration with the RHS Bridgewater, which of course is, um, is opening this summer, isn't it, excitingly? It is. Um, and I have visited it, so <laughs> we have been kind of making friends. Um, so as yet, because they have obviously had such a huge amount of work to get their site ready and open, and at the same time we're building our new extension, we haven't uh, really kind of got any formal ideas yet, but we are sort of on each other's radar to do things um, together, not least because they'll be, uh, we're having a new Chinese culture gallery and they are opening their Chinese streamside garden. So there's something of a synergy between those two. Um, and in general, across the museum collection, we do have some things which came from their site. So they might show, say, some of the fossils that came from, um, uh, from that area. Great, thank you. Um, I think we've just got time for a couple more questions. Donald has asked about uh, are there any invasive plants of particular concern at the moment? I don't know if, if you'd like to talk about briefly about invasives, Rachel. I know I know lots lots of them are of concern to us uh, here in Manchester. Um, yeah, I guess the um, well, I mean the thing that has really been marked for me lately is less about um, invasive plants and more about invasive plant diseases because the park opposite me they've been felling trees for ash dieback so we've lost 19 of the trees along the road which is really going to feel like a big difference um, and now I understand what people used to say about Dutch elm disease because that was a little bit before my time. Um, but in terms of um, problematic weeds I mean I, I think we're still with um, Japanese knotweed and um, Himalayan balsam, really, aren't we? And so th there are some hopeful things, though, like a uh, rust fungus has arrived, hasn't it, that has started to uh, live on the Himalayan balsam. So the hope that they, um, they, they sort of might not be quite so successful competitors and not so invasive. Um, I think we're never going to eradicate them, I imagine, from the British Isles. So the hope that they sort of settle into something uh, that's a little bit more ecologically stable. But yeah, knows, yeah, that would be good. I that's know. On geological timescales. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as certainly since the floods recently, uh, you know, I know the seed yeah. bank along the River Valley green spaces in Manchester will be awash with yeah. a new. A new crop. crop. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, at all. Okay. Um, uh, there's maybe one more. I've got a little bit of an echo. Sorry, everyone. Um, can you recommend any tall wildflowers for a wet garden? Ooh, uh, purple loose strife is reasonably tall. It depends how tall tall is really, but you know, it's vertical <laughs> spires of purple flowers and that likes to be boggy. So that's quite a good one. Um, presuming you don't want to go on, you know, uh, full on kind of Phragmites reeds. Um, they're a bit too tall. So yeah, I'd, I'd probably go with purple loose dry. Um, very pretty as well. Very pretty. Good for pollinators. Um, and there's one about any weeds in your collection we no longer have. So it depends on your definition of weed, really, is my final statement of that weed or wildflower thing. So weediness, I come from a, a seed germination background, seed science. So weediness in seeds is a characteristic of kind of um, being able to colonize disturbed ground, like Hillary said about the um, Himalayan balsam coming up on the areas that have been flooded. That'd be a classic kind of sign of being a weedy plant that's able to kind of capitalize on an area that some sometimes just become available and uh, and grow there. Um, but then there's there's lots of examples of plants which are no longer lots. There are examples of plants in the UK that are no longer living here. Um, but that's probably more to do with ones which are have very special um, specific niches and they really like to grow under particular conditions. So weeds tend to be things that can um, 
are very generalist and can thrive in lots of places. So you're more likely to have things go locally extinct if they really like a particular kind of um, sort of growing conditions, the right kind of soil, the right kind of bit Goldilocks. Um, and so then if something changes to that habitat, um, they no longer thrive and then you lose them from an area. So technically, probably you shouldn't get a weed that goes extinct. So I'm going to have to Google that now to find out. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. Well, I think that sort of brings us probably to the end of today's talk. Um, thank you, Rachel, so much. That was just so, I learned so many things. I probably